Okay, so in part one, we extracted a broken bicuspid tooth and grafted it with platelet-rich fibrin and a resorbable collagen membrane. Now it's healed for three months. If it's a multi-rooted tooth, if it's a molar tooth, I mean, if it's three or four roots, I'll let that heal for six months. And you're not making a mistake if you let any socket graft heal for six months because you want that bone to be very dense. In this case, since it was a smaller tooth, I felt like three months of healing would be fine. Well, this is a before and after. This is a, a screw retained implant, abutment, and crown. So this is after three months of healing. You can see that socket's nice and dense. Now I'm going to use the easy stent. Now if y'all aren't using this for implant placement, you are messing up. It's so easy and it's so effective. I'm not going to tell you anything that's not the truth from a practical practicing experience. Remember, I practice four days a week, just like you. We video, I narrate over the videos on Friday and Saturday morning, but I'm practicing Monday through Thursday from eight in the morning till six at night. So if it doesn't work in the office, I promise you, I am not going to tell you about it. I don't get any endorsement from these people. This is just stuff that works. So the easy stint is the surgical guide I've been looking for. And it has videos on their site, but you're marking the center of the socket. Then they give you this drill and you drill parallel to those lines. Then you place this little metal cylinder in there and that metal cylinder should be lined up along the line axis of the adjacent teeth. Then you put it in this boiling water. Now what we're, or actually what we're doing now is just putting it in a cup. They give you a boiling pot that you can boil this in, but we find just taking hot water out of the water dispenser and putting this in there for not very long, a few seconds, is adequate. This is just a, a paper cup with hot water in it. So it's not hot water out of the faucet. I don't know if that would work or not. We haven't tried that. This is hot water out of our water dispenser, you know, the one where you push the hot. So you want to wet the model, or you can put Vaseline on it if you want to. Leave that cylinder in and put this metal opening over the cylinder, then adapt it to the adjacent teeth. And it's real easy to do. See, this goes over the cylinder. And once you get it like you want it, run it over, over some cold water and it turns, it turns clear when it's ready to mold and it turns white when it's reset. And that doesn't take the marking of the model, the drilling of the hole, the heating of the, of the stent and the cooling it. If you really knew what you were doing and got with it, it probably takes five minutes or less. So it's very easy. Then you're going to disinfect the stent. See, here's the surgical guide, the easy stent, and you're going to disinfect it with whatever you disinfect with. We just put it in a plastic bag and leave it for the appropriate amount of time and then rinse it off real well. Put it in a cup full of water and rinse the sterilizing solution off. So this is this fitting in the mouth. Fits perfectly. See, and the nice thing, it doesn't go, you don't want this all the way down to the, you can go down to the tissue because you're going to reflect that tissue. So you want this to be as close to the tissue as you can get it. Then you're going to make your incision on the palatal side because you, whether it's the mandible or the maxilla, you always want to reflect the flap toward you, toward the facial. You don't ever make the incision down the center of the edentulous area because you, the thing you don't want is a flap on the palatal, lingual, and a flap on the facial because you've got to retract both those flaps. You just want one flap coming toward the facial. So make your releasing incision on the palatal about at the mesial palatal line angle right here. You don't make it way out here. Make it from line angle to line angle of the tooth and that will expose the uh, grafted area. Then you release on the mesial and the distal of the flap and we're going to reflect this flap 
to the facial. This is just a periosteal elevator to full thickness flap. You can see how solid this is. Now I'm, <coughs> I'm using my application on my computer and taking a radiograph from the alveolar crest apical and seeing how much room I've got. So I've got plenty of room. The longest implant I'm using is 14 millimeters. So I've got with the dentist system. So it's plenty of uh, room. Now you see that measured over 20 because I've got to factor in the vertical height of the stent. So it's not a problem if you drill a little bit too far. It's not a problem if you drill a little bit too far as long as you're not drilling into anything you don't want to drill into. That's what that radiograph is for to see what's up there because you don't want to drill into the nasal cavity you know, if you're a little bit into the sinus, that's okay. You can refer to that article that we have in dentistrymasterclasses.com about penetration of implants into the sinus. So this drill comes with the easy stent and it perfectly fits into that hole and you know you're in the right spot. See, so this is drilling through the hole into the bone and then I can take the stent off and just keep it in the osteotomy and drill to the proper depth, which is about 15 millimeters. Remember the, the longest implant I'm using, root form implant, is 14, so that's plenty of depth. You know it's lined up perfectly along the long axis of the adjacent teeth. I'm gonna take a radiograph and see that's ideal. Right in the middle and check it from the facial and from the, from the buckle and be sure it's aligned properly. I like the dentist system because it's the only one I've found that has shoulders on the drills. Now, what are you afraid of as a dentist when you're placing implants? You're afraid of drilling into the inferior, inferior alveolar nerve primarily or drilling too far into the sinus or drilling into the nasal cavity. These shoulders present that, prevent that, they're fail-safe. Whereas if you're using BioRisons, Strawman, Branamark, any of those, those are very good systems. And many times we'll use one of their implants, but we never use their drill system because it is too damn scary. And we can't get these companies to understand all the drills for implants, just a basic thing ought to be that they have a shoulder. So once you get the depth with your first drill, you don't have to think about it again. You just go boom, boom, boom. And that shoulder hits the alveolar crest and it stops. You don't have to try to read that black, find that black line or the indention in the drill in the midst of a spinning silver drill with blood, saliva, and water, and light, it's just ridiculous. So the dentist drill system is the best system, and that's what we're using here. See, it's got the shoulder, so you just go straight to place and stop. Once you've determined your length, this is 14 millimeters, it takes probably <coughs> under five minutes to get to the terminal drill. And you want to take a radiograph with the drill in the osteotomy about every two drills just to be sure your alignment has remained correct. See, so now we're to the 4.1 and it's just boom, boom, boom. So easy and see the shoulder stops it. It's ingenious, but you would think they would all do this. I don't know what they're thinking. The other, other uh, implant systems by not having a shoulder on the drill. See, so we take this radiograph to be sure it's just right. So we get to 4.1. Now, how do you decide what width of implant you wanna use? You want at least a millimeter of bone all the way around the implant. So look at the drill and be sure when the drill's in the osteotomy, there's at least a millimeter of bone all the way around the implant. If not, you either don't want to go that far with the width of the implants or you've got to graft the buccal side. So this is a 4.1. Now, like everything about the dentist system, but the, the awful thing about their system is they don't have a closed tray impression coping. 
So you have to either use an open tray or if you, use, if you don't have enough room for an open tray, you've got to seat the abutment yourself and take an imp use an impression coping on the abutment. Now, why not make it perfect? Why not every implant system, why not make it perfect? Which is shoulders on the drill and a closed tray impression coping. Because if you're in the back of the mouth, there's not enough vertical space to use an open tray impression. That's where you've got the, the impression coping sticking up about that far and a tray in the mouth. And in a small woman that can't open her mouth very far, you can't get all that in there because then you've got to get a screwdriver back there to unscrew the op or loosen the open tray impression coping. It's ridiculous. So you need both the shoulders on the drills and the closed tray impression coping uh, capability so you don't have to put all that stuff in the back of somebody's mouth that can't open very wide. Many times we're using a combination of the dentist drills, but BioRisons or some other implant system because it's back in the mouth. We don't have enough room for an open tray, impression coping, the impression tray, and a screwdriver. The patient can't open wide enough. I just placed some implants on a person, uh, on a man the other day and a woman in the second molar area. Now, most of the time you don't implant second molars. You just leave those teeth out, but there was plenty of vertical space for bone. And so there's no way that I can use an open tray impression coping on those people. You've got to have a closed tray impression, which means you don't have to put a screwdriver back there. It just pulls the impression coping uh, off the tooth. I'll show you in other videos. So you screw this in to 35 Newton centimeters, the implant, then screw the healing cap, the flat healing cap on top of it, and then suture it. And I believe this is 3-0 gut. See, I've got one on the mesial, one on the distal, and one in between. We'll let that heal for three months. See, this is not in the maxillary sinus, but many times I'll place the implant into the maxillary sinus one to two millimeters. Read this article on the significance or non-significance of penetration of the maxillary sinus with implants. I started researching this several years ago because I couldn't find anybody with the answer, but we had uh, some all on four courses at my teaching center in Dallas. And these surgeons would place these implants all the way through the sinus into the zygomatic arch if there wasn't enough vertical bone for an implant in the sinus area. So I thought, well, it must not be life and death if you penetrate the sinus. So there, this article, in DentistryMasterClasses.com is the best article I've found explaining uh, the pros and cons and what is the significance of penetration of the, max, the floor of the maxillary sinus with an implant. So read that. This is an angulation issue with the radiograph that was perfectly, so that's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time.